Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me here today. Um, like Zoe was saying, my name is Tyler. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am one of the many project leads at Grassroots Ecology. And that means I get the joy of getting to connect people like all of you to the incredible local open spaces that we have here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I'm gonna start by just talking a little bit about myself. I, like Zoe was saying, I've been a big nature nerd my entire life. I grew up in Southern California and I had the absolute privilege of j even just getting to walk to school through some local parks. And while walking to school, I just loved being outside. When I would wait for my parents to come home from work, I would just play tag with my brother in the trees and get lost in the forest nearby. And I just loved every minute of being outside. Then once I got to high school, I had my very first career goal, like we were saying, to protect the trees. And me at 14, I would show up to high school and I would not wear anything unless it had a tree on it. When people asked me, what do you want for Christmas or Hanukkah this year? I'd say, I don't know, plant a tree in a different country. Um, and I didn't really know what it meant to protect the trees until I took an AP environmental science class in high school. And that really made me passionate about figuring out what we can do as people to help protect our environment from the threats of climate change. This took me to UC Santa Cruz, where I studied environmental studies, specializing in environmental education. While I was there, I interned with state parks and a nonprofit called Save Our Shores. And through these internships, I really honed in that my version of protecting the trees was getting other people to care about them too. And through this all, I worked in outdoor education. Um, between those internships and my job at the Web of Life Field School, I was in outdoor education for seven years. And all this time, the passion that kept me going through it is that I believe that everybody deserves access to the incredible outdoor spaces that we all have on this planet. And this all led me to grassroots ecology where not only do I get to connect people to nature, but we get to talk about plants and trees specifically. So my role at Grassroots Ecology, I manage restoration projects at Foothills Nature, nature Preserve here in the mountains, as well as a few different preserves with the Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District. So what I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna start a little bit with what we are as Grassroots Ecology, why native plants are so important, and some of the threats of invasive plants, and why we do this as a community effort, why it's all of us working together instead of just the environmental professionals. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about some of the different career options that can lead people into the environmental field, because there's a lot more than people realize. And then there's some specific local ones I wanna to talk to you all about as well. So what is grassroots ecology? Ooh. There we go. So grassroots ecology staff come from so many different backgrounds. Some of us are scientists. Some people like myself come from education. And all of us are just nature enthusiasts. Do any of you, just, do any of you identify as a nature enthusiast of some sort? Feel free to raise your hand if you do. Yay, awesome. Uh, do any of you have any local parks that you like to go to? Feel free to, yeah, go for it. Shoot Park, oh my God, one of our restoration sites is actually just right next to that one called Redwood Grove. That's just down the street here. Anyone else? Yeah. Huh? Climb Pod? Oh, awesome. See, there's so many incredible parks here. Um, and we all just love having people at our parks and we think it's really important. And we all really are passionate about building community together. So we do this through a bunch of different ways. Our biggest programs is habitat restoration, community science, urban ecology. We have a lot of education programs that you all can participate in if you would like. And then we also have a native plant nursery. So our habitat restoration, we actually do at 25 different sites, going from Los Gatos all the way up to Redwood City. 
and then from the bay up into the mountains. So we cover this really large range and we continue to work at these places and really try to bring people like you all out. As you can see, the th theme that goes through everything we do is getting people like y'all out to our preserves. We do a lot of water quality monitoring and community science with urban water systems. We do a lot of naturalist education. So we have a program for students like you all, that's our youth stewards program. And we do um, a lot of education through that and stewardship. Then we have internships for students. We have a summer naturalist internship where people can become certified California naturalists. Let's see. Sorry, I keep going up there instead. There we go. And then we have our nursery. Our nursery is kind of the pride and joy of grassroots ecology. Have any of you planted a native plant or do any of you have any favorite native plants? Feel free to shout out a native plant if you like one. Yeah, go for it. Poppies, yeah, how many of you know poppies? My hot tip about poppies, if you look at the tips of their leaves, they have little dots of pink on them. It's kind of like a little secret surprise. Um, but all of our native plants at our nursery um, are grown from seeds that we collect in the wild. So there's so much to do of just exploring our parks, getting to go find specific plants and collect those seeds, and we take them back to our nursery where they get to grow. Our California native plants are really, really crucial. Uh, does anyone know some of the benefits of our native plants besides what's up here on the screen? Awesome, I can talk about this stuff. So our native plants provide habitat and food for all sorts of organisms. They have adapted here for millions of years and they have pollinators and animals specifically associated with them that can't really thrive on some of the other plants that have been introduced from other parts of the world. They slow and spread stormwater, they stabilize our creek banks, they don't need nearly as much water as uh, traditional lawns, and they store a lot of carbon dioxide that is one of the biggest threats for climate change. So getting into providing the habitat, who's seen a monarch butterfly before? Who likes monarchs? Does anyone know which specific plant monarchs rely on? Yeah, go for it. Milkweed, yeah. So milkweed habitat is really under threat here. So part of what we do is plant and monitor milkweeds specifically for our monarch butterflies. And monarchs are just one example of the many species that rely on our native plants. And here it's not on a milkweed, it's on a coyote mint instead, but its primary source of nutrients and habitat is that narrow-leafed milkweed that you can find here. So that's just one of the things that our native plants do is they provide habitat to these organisms. They stabilize our creeks. So you can see in these images right here, one is a hillside that's just non-native wild oak grass and the other one is an image of the same creek with a willow tree instead. When it's these non-native plants, they have really shallow roots, and then when the big storm events happen, like you all experienced this last winter, then they take a lot of the soil with them, and it causes a lot of ecosystem harm. When the willow trees and other native plants have deeper roots that'll hold the stream banks together, and it makes them erode a little bit less. So you can see, for example, here, some of the things that they can do. They're drought tolerant. So how many of you had to water plants at home before? Anybody? Yeah. So when you plant flowers or you plant a garden or a lawn, you have to water it every couple of days to be able to make sure that it survives the hot, dry California summers. But our native plants are adapted for it. They already know that all of the days in the summer are going to be 90 degrees and they don't need water for that time. Even our baby plants, you only have to water once every few weeks. So they do really, really well. And like I was saying, these deep roots can store some carbon dioxide. You can see kind of our native purple needle grass. Did any of you know that California has a state grass? 
No. California has a state everything. We have a state grass. We have a state soil type. We have a state flower, a state bird. Um, we're really nat big nature nerds in California. And you can see how different our state grass, their roots are compared to this non-native one. So then here we have some of the invasive plants. Just for the sake of time, I'll kind of speed through them a little bit. Invasive plants are plants that are introduced from other continents. And not all plants that are from other continents cause ecosystem harm, but some specific species that don't get eaten by our wildlife do because they don't have anything to keep them in check. And a lot of those plants end up being big fire hazards, they take resources away, and they end up growing in these dense monocultures where nothing else can compete with them. So we think it's really important to increase our biodiversity here in the state by removing some of these invasives. Here's a few examples of some of the ones that you might see around here. Do, do any of these look familiar to any of you? Yeah? Who's, anyone want to shout out one of these that you've seen before? Milk thistle. Milk thistle, Milk thistle is all over the place and it's terrible. So then why do we do this community base? Why do you all think, what do you think is a benefit of having a community join us in these restoration efforts? Does anyone have any thoughts? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, it makes us go a lot faster. We get a lot more done. Do you want a sticker? You can say no. Sure, here, you can have a sticker. I'll toss it down for you. <laughs> here, you get a sticker. Anybody else have an idea of why it might be important for community-based things? Yeah. Yeah, it's easier for you to get involved. If you need a big, like if you need an advanced degree to get into it in the first place, then that's a big barrier to entry. But if we do it as a community effort, then anybody can be a part. And I saw you already got a sticker. Anyone else have any thoughts? Yeah, go for it. It can help educate people. It can help educate people, totally. We all need to know about these issues that are facing our community in order to work together. As we, conti as we continue to live in a time of a changing climate, we all need to be part of the solution. I don't know if y'all, have any of you heard this phrase, if we're not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. So if we all work together and are part of the solution, we can make a really big impact. Even in our own backyards, if we add native plants, it allows a, a pollinator habitat, even in our urban areas that, are under, that our current habitat has been under threat. Then also, it's just so much more fun when we're all here hanging out together. Grassroots Ecology has been using restoration to not only get, accomplish these big tasks, but also bring community together. So for example, some of the events we have that you can see some pictures of here, we have some events that are just specifically for anybody in the public. We have some events that are for members of the LGBTQ community. We have some events that are people, for people who speak Spanish, for people who celebrate Chinese New Year. And by holding these spaces specifically, we are able to be more welcoming to people who might not come to an event otherwise. And we want everyone to be welcome in our spaces outside. Let's see. So what can you do? Anyone have any thoughts on things you can do in addition to planting natives? Yeah. Totally, once you have a native plant, you can water it. Anyone else have any ideas? Yeah. Removing harmful invasive species. Yeah, you can remove harmful invasive species back at home. Anyone else have any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, plant more trees. Plant more trees, exactly. And that actually gets into some of the stuff in my next slides, too. So we can plant our native plants. You can plant and care for oak trees. So their oak trees specifically provide so much habitat. They 
host 300 vertebrae species like birds. Uh, they host 370 fungus species, 5,000 insects, 2,000, and 2,000 native plants can be associated with them. So it's really important to us to have this oak woodland habitat and oak trees specifically. Then you can also leave leaves. We've always been told to rake the leaves to make things look a little prettier, but the leaves actually provide a lot of habitat for insects that might be hiding underneath and it makes them a little less obvious to the birds and other predators nearby. And then you can also add a bird box that provides a lot of potential options for um, habitat, especially for nesting birds that usually would be in the cavities of trees, but now with more buildings up, they don't have quite as many trees as they used to. And then like we were saying, educate other people is a huge thing that you can do. So we at Grassroots Ecology believe in what we call the stewardship path. There is a lot of different ways that people can be involved. And sometimes it's the community-based efforts, like I was saying, uh, where people come out and volunteer with us for one day. Then sometimes people come to an event and realize they really love it and want to learn more and join the, our Youth Stewards program, where you can come once a week and be really dedicated to one specific place. A lot of our interns are former youth stewards. A lot of our AmeriCorps men members are current in or former interns. And a lot of our staff at Grassroots Ecology today actually started with us through this path as well. And so we at Grassroots Ecology want to support the next generation of environmental stewards like yourselves. So let's see. Here are some of the local organizations that I want to talk about to get involved and start this kind of path. Have any of you heard of AmeriCorps before? Do any of you know what I'm talking about when I say that? A couple, awesome. So AmeriCorps is a nationwide program. So no matter where you end up, even if you move across the country, AmeriCorps is an option. Um, they hire people for usually about a year to get to work at one specific site with either a government agency, a nonprofit organization, a school, anything like that. And this is a big way that people enter the environmental field. Grassroots Ecology works with one called the Watershed Stewards Program that brings people from all over the state here to the Bay Area, specifically to restore creek sides as well as any sort of salmon habitat. The other one I wanted to plug is the Association of Environmental and Outdoor Educators. Um, that has a lot of options for environmental education jobs that can provide housing and then you get to play outside in the woods with young young kids for long, for the entire school year when they go to science camp. Did any of you ever go to like a sixth grade camp? Awesome. Probably Walden West or Jones Gulch if you're around here. And so that's where I worked for a long time was getting to bring kids out to the Redwood Forest. And so that's what some of these programs are. There's also local state parks. There's the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space. And these are all organizations that can provide, especially entry level opportunities for you all. Some other opportunities that I would really encourage y'all to look at if you go to college somewhere, uh, either a community college or a four year university. A lot of colleges have internship programs where you can either get paid for your internship or you can get college credit. And those internships are such an incredible gateway. I'll tell y'all that I learned a lot more from those internships than I did from a lot of the college classes that I took. And those were really what led me to get into a job that I was really excited about. Then if you talk to other local environmental organizations wherever you end up, so around here, it's some of the ones on the previous slide, there's always ways to get involved and ways to help give knowledge or, and give experience and time to these people. Then there's also always different opportunities with labs. There's community science projects. Have any of you ever used the app iNaturalist? Ooh, a couple, awesome. Have any of you ever looked at a plant and wondered what that plant is? A lot more. So this is an app. That, called iNaturalist. If you take a picture of a plant, 
you can put it in the app and it'll tell you exactly what the plant is. Um, and the way they do that is that other people look on the app and t will be able to identify it for you. And then when you add observations, it adds to this community science effort. So then people can use that data as research for the future as well. And these are all small ways that you can get involved in the environmental movement, even if that's not what you want to do for your entire career. But like I was saying before, this is something that we all need to work on together. And every little thing that we do like this is helpful, even putting these things in an app. So now I want to talk about our Youth Stewards program. This is something that you all directly can do, even in this school year. So we have sites at five different places. And you can volunteer with Grassroots Ecology once a week after school. We have them usually from 3.30 to 5.30-ish, depending on the site, um, starting in J at the end of January through the beginning of April. And when people come to our sites, we do a mix of getting to actually pull invasive plants, plant native ones. We get to um, learn about the site. We'll do studies about what plants are growing there, what the soil is like, and really do a lot of environmental science learning in that specific place. Usually groups are 15 to 20 students that come to these different programs. And the people who come end up leaving with new friends, as well as a deeper understanding of this site. Um, we ha I host it personally at Foothills Nature Preserve in the mountains. We have one at Redwood Grove. We have one at Burn Preserve here in Los Altos Hills. And we would really, really love y'all to come out and join us in these efforts. So I guess now I have some time for some questions. Does any, do any of you have any questions for me about what got me here? Or how to or how to get started in this kind of field? Oh yeah, go for it. Hi. So uh, this is more a question about butterflies, isn't it? Yeah. A, isn't it relevant that milkweed is incredibly important because butterflies' uh, migration pattern has them in California a lot of the year, as opposed mm -hmm. to other parts of the West Coast? Yeah, totally. Um, so. Something that's really special about California's climate is that since it's not too cold here in the wintertime, butterflies will cluster in certain areas with their habitat, with potential habitat, and stay there through the winter. And then once it gets warmer, they'll continue their intergenerational migration. So to get from um, Mexico up the west coast through the into Canada, they do the whole migration over four different generations, where one generation will go part of the way, then the next generation will go the next, and it's a big, long cycle. Thank you for that question. Who else? Um, yeah. Uh, where's a good place to sign up for the volunteering? Yeah, the best place to sign up for our volunteering is grassrootsecology.org. We'll have some stickers for you all, and we'll it'll have our website on it where you can sign up for our newsletter and sign up for any specific events. Who else has questions? Yeah. What's, the, what's your favorite project that you've ever worked on? Ooh, that's a great question. So this last year, the TLDR of it is we planted 14,000 plants. Um, the longer story is that with all of the heavy rains this year, one of the preserves that we work at called Bear Creek Redwoods is, was not open to the public anymore. and. In, they had all these plants that we were going to plant um, that their original location didn't work out. So they came to us and said, hey, we need all of these plants in the ground within a month. And with the logistics of all the other things we had to do, we actually only had six days to plant 14,000 plants, which was absolutely nuts. So we called everybody we know and got everybody out. And you all remember what it was like this February, where it was just dumping rain on us. It was snowing. And we were just like, go, 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 trying to get as many plants in the ground as we possibly could. But now that I have been watching those plants for six months since, I've gotten to see them grow. And it's been really rewarding to watch them all survive and grow afterwards. 
What else? Yeah. Uh, what did you guys do during COVID? What did we do during COVID? That's actually where our youth stewards program started. Um, because we couldn't host our big public events anymore. We started developing these stable cohorts of youth stewards where people would come to us for these eight for eight weeks instead of 10 to 12. And then it would be the same group of students every week um, for those eight weeks at a time. And then that way it was a stable group. We knew all who was coming. We were all masked. And thankfully we were always outside. So we were able to be pretty COVID safe from that. Oh yeah. Do you have a favorite animal? Ooh, my favorite animal. Let's see. I have a few. Um, I really love nudibranchs for my sea animal because, have any of you seen a nudibranch before? A couple, one or two. So they're a type of sea slug, but they look like a party underwater where you, they're like an electric blue color with like bright orange tentacles. And some of them are pink, some of them are like rainbow colored. And then I also really love coyotes and foxes because um, they, one are just like big dogs, but also they are really important to our ecosystem. Awesome questions, who else? Um, how does one plant a tree? How does one plant a tree? Well, there's a couple different ways. The first way is from a seed. Does anybody know what kind of seed an oak tree makes? You can just shout it out. An acorn, exactly. So you can actually just stick some acorns into the ground and sometimes that'll be planting an oak tree and you'll see a little sprout come up the next year. Otherwise, you can actually buy some either from our nursery or from other nurseries or in the area. And then you can um, dig out a little hole in the ground, you put your tree in. Sometimes you have to ruffle up the roots a little bit and then you make sure you water it for a little while. Um, so those are kind of the two main ways people get their oaks in the ground. Who else? Yeah. How does getting certified as a California naturalist work and what does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. So getting certified as a California naturalist. So the University of California has this program called the California Naturalist Certification. And you don't have to be a UC student to go through this program. Um, they offer it either as like a 10 day workshop or you can do it through a bunch of different organizations all over the state where you kind of take a little extra class. Um, and Grassroots Ecology offers it in partnership with an internship so that people come to us and so we teach a little bit along the way and so it's kind of like a mix of a class and an internship. And then after you get this program and you get the California Naturalist certification, it makes you eligible for more jobs and it shows anybody that looks at your resume that you know what you're talking about when it comes to plants and wildlife and animals. Anyone else? Um, are you guys doing any work in aquatic life, uh, plant life? A little bit. Um, have any of you been to the Palo Alto Baylands Preserve? Awesome. So a few of you have. So one of our restoration sites is at Cooley Landing that's kind of near the Palo Alto Baylands. And it's more in East Palo Alto. And then we also work at Ravenswood Open Space. And in these places, we're not in the water, but we're in the marshland. And so we're kind of planting in the mud there. But sometimes while we do restoration there, we see like ray, manta ray or bat rays and other aquatic life. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite part about working at Grassroots Ecology? My favorite part is a mix of things. I would say the two, th I get, I'm gonna limit it to two um, because I love everything about my job. Um, one is that I love being outside and sharing it with other people and getting to bring people outside. Um, the other is that I love the conversations that I have with all of our volunteers and youth stewards because all of you bring such incredible perspectives to what we're doing and bring up things that I would never even think about. So I think it's really important to get to talk to people. Yeah. Um, when you were younger and you would chase your brother like in <laughs> you climb them? 
Um, I was never good at climbing trees because I've been a klutzy my entire life and I trip over everything, so I didn't want to fall out of the trees. <laughs> Great question, though. My brother was a tree climber, though. He's in the circus now. Um, All right, good questions, everyone. We maybe have time for one or two more. Anything else? Yeah? One more over there? No? <laughs> What's your favorite plant? My favorite plant? Um, I absolutely w love wildflowers to the point that I maybe startle people in the car because I'll gasp with excitement when I see them while we're driving. Um, but my all-time favorite wildflower is these plants called lupins. Have any of you seen these before? They're a couple. So there's purple flowers, and something that's really special about them is that they add nitrogen into the soil whenever they grow. So they actually make the soil better for other plants that are growing around them too. And I love that kind of collaborative effort because a lot of plants are working together underground in ways that we don't even know. 